Beyond Organizational Change is proudly presented by the Enterprise Agility University. The place where science meets organizational change. Visit us at enterpriseagility.university. Hello guys, welcome to our fourth episode of Beyond Organizational Change. We survived three, we are going for the fourth one now, and I hope you are enjoying it. We try to bring a different perspective, and today we have a special guest, but before talking about our guest, I want to thank Simon Rendell. He is with me today. He's going to be also co-presenting. He's the author of Mastering Professional Scrum, co-author. He is also a change consultant, a professional Scrum trainer, and also is a certified training partner at the Enterprise Agility University in the UK. And he's originally from Australia. But I discovered that a few days ago. And also today we have Monica Costa from Mexico. She is an innovator. She's an agilist. She's a coach certified by EMCC. She specializes in future design and she's a certified training partner also at the Enterprise Agility University. And today we have our super guest, Stephanie Puket. She's a psychologist. She is an executive coaching and she's an ICP ACC certified agile coach. A certified practitioner, PMI. She has like millions of certifications, so I could probably stay the whole podcast here. Uh, she is the owner of Psychology for Agility, and she had many books. I don't know if the other books are in German or English, but I found the latest one, which is the Agile Culture Coach, is in English. And today we are going to be talking about organizational health, about culture. She specializes in culture. She's a specialist in culture and leadership. And then let's just start with something very, very basic. I know that many, many people listening to this podcast are Scrum Masters, Agile Coaches, or maybe they are starting with trying to influence or change a company. And I know Stephanie wrote a lot about culture. So let's start with the very, very basic, which is culture for you. Let's start with something very basic to clarify and then from there we move. Can you explain that in a few words? First of all, thanks for inviting me in this nice round here. Um, I'm excited to be here and I hope it's beneficial for the listeners. Of course, of course it's going to be. <laughs> um, so what is culture for me? What is organizational culture for me? I, I am a psychologist, as Eric, you mentioned, um, so I like to really stick to the basic definition, which I would use from um, Shine, is uh, the guy for um, organizational culture. And it is basically a pattern of uh, the way people think and act and feel, um, which then will be, or which then gets... Um, gets in fact by how decisions are taken, how collaboration takes place, um, how symbols are used within the company. Um, to me, if you ask me what is organizational culture, I would say it's the way people work. When you, It's usually when you join a company, um, you're the new person on board. You Usually, if you're smart, you're a good observer. So you'll check, you keep your eyes and ears open and you will learn quickly what the hierarchy looks like. You will learn quickly what amount of freedom people have and how flexible people are within their collaboration. So we get a, early on, pretty fast, a good feel of the company culture. We lose it after we've been in that company for a year. It gets really hard to describe what our culture really is because we're so much part of it. We lack the distance. Yeah, and if I, if I may add something here, I find it very interesting because the discussion around culture is picking up throughout the globe based on the pandemic. And I see um, you guys may, may share this experience. And my take on it is since we were all sitting in our home office, away from, from uh, the physical office, and we kind of have a little bit of time to reflect, we have more distance to our workplace. 
So I feel like this is when people started to notice again, what their culture really looks like, what helps them, what keeps them going, especially in a difficult time and what hinders them. If we focus on culture, let's talk about certain basic elements, because I understand that when we're talking about culture, we have certain things that happen in the culture when it, let's say, traditional company and other things that we expect from an agile company. And by traditional, I'm talking about many things that have been happening. Maybe people have been doing the same for many, many years. And, and then agile companies have different characteristics. Which kind of things you think are different between one and the other? That's a whole long list, um, I have to say. Let's just start for a very basic. Let's just start with two or three values. If we try to envision the traditional company, and there are traditional companies out there which are pretty agile. Um, so let's. I'm going to focus on those who are really command control based, top down, who are slow, who are heavy in bureaucracy, and who are usually pretty risk avoidant. And let's say they are set in their way. So usually they have heavy processes, um, regulations, and uh, pretty let's say, tightly defined job roles for the people. That's This to me is the uh, traditional company, which I think from, by the way, I'm describing it and talking slower because I feel the bureaucracy really <laughs> holding me down. It's This kind of the work that happens in a traditional company is usually very reliable. It's usually with a good quality and efficiency. And it's, it's steady, it's stable, and that's important. While if you look at an agile company, the first difference that pops really into, into mind is flexibility, adaptability. And that comes in, I'd say, most agile companies with a price tag and this price tag is freedom which means that agile organizations and their culture are really highly determined by freedom down on the team level empowerment self-organization so an agile company works fine if the people on the edges of the organization which connect directly to the customer or to the ecosystem of the organizations. If those people are enabled to sense change and to sense what's happening on the market with their customers and at the same time are able to react to it. And that's the freedom I was talking about. The freedom to adapt their own behavior, the freedom to make changes, maybe even make st strategic decisions on the team level to be able to immediately react to the changes they're sensing. You probably have read in uh, my latest book, you mentioned uh, the Agile Culture Code. I spent about one and a half years to try to decode what's really different in Agile organizations on the culture level. So if you want, I can lead you through it. Or do you want to stay for now on this um, broad level? I just want to ask something, Stephanie, because you mentioned right now something that is also related to what you call the tech model. And I honestly found this super interesting because you mentioned that you are basically based on three pillars. And one of them is, is, uh, is, is transparency. The other is freedom, the other is collaboration. And when you mentioned that, the question that came is coming to my mind is uh, how can you really provide this motivation in terms of freedom to the employees of the company? Because sometimes they don't really feel that they have this motivation. And I think if they don't really make it and create an ownership into that is exactly when you start to struggle in how can you behave that part and the evaluation process. So I would like to ask you in your experience how, uh, how employees or how leaders in the company can really start to create this environment for the organization To, to create this ownership for the employees instead of to keep it motivation in goals, in freedom, in collaboration and transparency. I like this. Thank you. That's a, a change in perspective, looking at from the angle of employees who might be provided with empowerment, but are not motivated to really step up and take it. And especially when we look into these traditional organizations making an effort to transform to agile, sometimes that's what they encounter. 
people who are, um, let's say, politely in the background or maybe a little resistant and are not willing to step up and really take over um, that ownership and that initiative. And this has a history, usually. So if we find this kind of situations, sometimes the answer why and how to change it lies in history. If I worked for 10 years and I'm used to being told what to do, I'm used to not knowing really what impact my work has. I'm just blindly doing task after task I'm assigned. And then one day to the next day, I'm told to just do my job, take my own decisions. Um, I don't know if I would be able to adapt that quickly. And I think this is what a lot of people struggle with. You will not be able to change years and years of work habits within a moment. So the first thing here is time. Then the other part is trust. I think it's important to focus on history. We have seen many companies where many coaches go there. They stay for a few months. They don't know what happened before. Then someone else is coming, start from zero, and they never ask or try to find out or read between the lines of what happened here before. And actually, I think what you're saying is great. It's crucial. People generally, if, if um, in Spanish we say, if you burnt yourself with milk, then you see a cow and you cry. And this is many times what happens. So you generally experience something and then after some time even if you do not remember that your brain remembers it your amygdala activates again in very irrational situations how we solve that this is so important that is actually what culture is built on exactly these kind of experiences i burn my fingers here i do it once and it enters my memory and i will pass that experience on to others i might not be able to explain it but a role model a behavior they learn so if I tried to step up in the past, for example, and took my own decision on a matter, on an important matter, and I got demoted, or I got in really big trouble and uh, basically landed in the out group and uh, been cut off of my line manager or the team gave me troubles, I will remember it. And if new colleagues join me and carefully, for example, just tell me about their ideas, um, which might be a little radical or even disruptive, I will probably tell them, you know what? This is a great idea. Let's keep it between ourselves for now. So make too many noises because this is not the way this company operates. That's probably a sentence so many people have heard. And it is absolutely like you said, someone burned, got burned. And the problem is when we are in an organization and same with the TSC model, we go there, we present it, people seem to be nodding and excited about it, but no change is happening. And then it's the, that's the latest opportunity for us to look in the history where the attempts to a more agile culture that have been beaten down or that failed, often also due to um, a total lack of preparation. And this is the other part um, why people maybe are reluctant or not motivated to take ownership and self-organize because the conditions aren't right. It is not prepared. They might not have the proper information they need to be able to prioritize their work. Maybe there was no teamwork so far. Think about it. A lot of teams, so-called teams, are simply groups of people working in the same department, each one on their tasks. That's not a team. So all of a sudden now they need to, they need to be codependent and take decisions together. This is, that's a tough step um, to take. That means the team has to develop. Is that prepared? Usually not. And often then, even if the team says, okay, we're gonna take more decisions and try to steer ourselves in a certain direction, will the others listen? So the other departments, do they see us as empowered decision makers or will they bypass us and go to our manager? Um, to, to get approval. So it's, it's, I actually have another model which you'd also find in the book that lies out these conditions we have to prepare ahead of time before we ask people to step up. And then I wanted to come back to um, Monica, this question of motivation. People might not be motivated. And I have a beautiful quote I want to share with you. 
Without information, you cannot take responsibility. With information, you cannot avoid responsibility. This is from uh, the CEO of SAS Airlines. And I like it a lot. I don't know if you know the little prince, this uh, French story. It's the same thing with his roles. You are acquainted with the facts of the company. So let's say, oh, actually, I have a nice example too. It's a um, mid-sized company that they kind of lost track of their culture and the numbers didn't look very good. They were in a pretty critical condition after a few years. And the leadership there, they said, we will not be able to turn this ship around by ourselves. So what they decided to do is radical transparency. So they called everyone together and they laid out the numbers. They showed where's the company standing, how high are the chances they will be here next year if nothing changes. Radical transparency. They also shared the first ideas they had to turn the ship around. Uh, it was an inclusive approach, so there were um, other measures taken, so employees were able to contribute and have a voice in the direction. And in their case, for example, this transparency about the situation the company is in created, um, you can say, a burning platform, but it definitely created urgency and it created the sense of responsibility. I now knew our company is in a bad place. I cannot look away. I have to look and see for myself what I can do to help. So I think giving this information to people, sharing and really yeah, speaking to them on equal footing, that creates a sense of responsibility. And this, the step from feeling responsible to taking ownership, this step is a smaller step. So that um, might be in some cases, yeah, the missing link for people to actually be motivated to do something. Yeah, so when you were talking about the, the history of companies, it reminds me of the famous monkey ladder experiment where the monkeys tried to climb the ladder and they get sprayed with water. And you, over time, you replace the monkeys and then they, they know that they can't go there. So what you're describing is a, a way of trying to break the cycle. Um, what you're talking about in timeliness uh, reminds me of the monkey ladder experiment. And when you're talking about the, the leadership coming in and being demonstrating that radical candor of this is the state of our organization, how do we encourage leadership to create the conditions to balance uh, freedom? And there needs to be some constraints. You know, how, how do we teach the leadership to create the conditions to change the system? The experience I make with leadership is, Maybe it's 50-50. 50% they see this idea of enablement, of empowerment, and um, how that in turn helps agility, and they like it. They're going to pretty intuitively, honestly, approach this thing and get their teams on board and let the teams guide the leadership in what conditions they need to be successful. That is about maybe half of them. Of course, that's a learning journey for them as well, but then you have the other half. And they focus on what do I gain, respectively, what do I lose? And let's face it, they lose a lot. In this kind of company, they lose um, authority, power, they lose influence. Um, they got to share it. They have to officially give up their expert status, which they probably don't have since years. But now it's official. So what do you give them in return? They might not ask you the question, but they want to know. And as long as you cannot answer them, okay, let's look at this new way of working. What could the role of you be as a leader in this, in this new setup? And what, you know, what, what new exciting tasks come upon you? Or what new chances do you have? If I can't answer that question, they're not going to react. And I totally understand. We have to paint a picture that's attractive for everyone. So what is the game for a leader? And there are games. It depends how the organization really would like to look like. But one thing I often experience is from leaders who say, I'm going to try it out. I'm going to step down is a very wrong wording. Who will say, I'll work with my team to empower them to work agile and help organizational agility. They first, I mean, the, the um, idea of servant leadership comes into play. And they 
try it out. They say, okay, let's get the team together. I focus on asking the right questions. I know my people, so I might be able to guide them here and there to come up with the best ideas, and I let them guide me. And leaders who experience this, they often feel a load is taken from their shoulders because the responsibility now is shared and they can enjoy and harvest the fruits of their leadership. What better proof is there for your performance as a leader than a team who honestly doesn't need you anymore? That's when you've done your job. And once a leader understands that, they can lead everywhere, everywhere. They can change, they can go in a completely different industry. They'll be successful because they lead through their people. So I think this experience is motivating. And usually you find a few of those leaders in the organization who might be able to change, to, to share their journey with the others, their learnings. How did they do it? And why are they in a better place now? And one of the easiest, quick ways you can communicate certainly is to get all this micromanagement off of your agenda that frees so much time and focus so you can really start acting strategic. You can start thinking over, you know, the rim of your plate. You can start connecting ideas and people beyond your own department. That means growth for you as well. And it also means exposure for you as a leader on a, on a much broader scale than what you had before. So I think These questions need to be answered for every organization. Since every organization is different, I'm sure there are different benefits that leadership can harvest, can um, expect if they try to really change the culture. So if I was listening properly, the, the generic pattern is to help these leaders realize that their, their, lead, their prestige isn't being threatened. It's an opportunity for them to lead out and around to guide their teams more strategically and that, that way they won't be threatened and that will reduce the resistance that they're going to, to show. Is, is that fair? That is a very nice you put. However, a little bit of their status is going to be lost because they have to face the image of leadership that they are not necessarily the ones who have all the answers. And for Many, for many, this is a bitter pill to, to swallow. And they just have to, like you said, have to experience by leading around, leading beyond, how they can find a new position people are going to look up to and say, this is, this is great. You know, I don't need you as my expert anymore, but you're a great mentor or you really opened up new opportunities with this new leadership style. And once I think the recognition and the appreciation comes, then that turnaround would probably be sustainable. One of the things that we generally encourage when we teach our courses, in fact, all our frameworks are based on organizational health, which for us is psychological safety plus creation of sustainable business value in perpetuity. All these kind of things cannot be done without slightly changing the values and the focus. And one of the things I read in one of your articles, you were talking about leadership, uh, we are pretty much aligned, is about clarity, equality, and cooperation. Is that something we really need when we are talking about value streams, that we, we it's not like just a software team. Maybe in order to produce something, we need different kind of people with different backgrounds, with different ways of thinking. Maybe in a value stream, you have a lawyer, Uh, you have an IT person, you have someone very traditional, someone who is not, and then for them, maybe the, the definition of a, a simple value of visibility is different. So how you try to encourage these values of clarity, equality, and cooperation that you were talking about? By first, not calling them values. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> Values are personal. Of course, an organization can have ethics and principles. They hopefully have. And they might be able to really, especially when they talk about their own business models, etc., to put up some, some values out there. But to me, I like focusing on working conditions, on working principles. And if you look at the, at the TEC model in this, um, this kind, when you really have transparency people have freedom and they 
have the right to, they have a voice and the right to use it, the right to take decisions, and they are able to connect with each other and show initiative and building the networks and finding support in the organization. I think if we have these three conditions, the aspect of psychological safety you mentioned, hopefully follows. If I have this, I have a good, I'm in a good place. I can, I can make my own decisions. I know what the, where the company is heading. I know what's going on and why. This should give me, or should at least enable me to trust the organization. If I know their intentions, that will help me. And if I know where decisions are taken, and if I experience that they even let me have a word in it and let me take own decisions, this again, this is the ultimate proof that at least the organization put trust in me. And the way trust goes is in two directions. By experience with the TEC model that the organization gives me the trust, I think I can trust the organization too. That helps. Trust me is, is one of the basic um, components for psychological safety. And if we have this on an individual level, then it can grow in teams and in the organization. See, I don't like values because that often puts in a, a question of moral or people being good or bad, which I unfortunately see a lot of times when consultants enter a company and say, you know, we need to get rid of this old way and traditional and bad. We have to have new ways of working. And I don't appreciate the moral behind it. So I like principles. And this is the easiest way to have maybe half of the company in favor and yes. maybe the other half resisting the change. Right. I can polarize with that. Yeah. If that helps me, I'm not sure. But I think this is the, um, yeah, that is one way of, uh, or one focus I would put in, in the work to try to, uh, to achieve that. This is super interesting, Stephanie. And I was about to ask you something, but now that, that you really did dive in the trust as a baseline of psychological tri uh, safety, I'm going to try to build on it and lay uh, my, my, my question on that. Because now that you mentioned in terms of leadership, we have now many different of leadership out there. Some of them, they have been in the industry for 20 years. Some of them, they are so young, but they are learning from these old leaders with a lot of experience in the traditional companies. And this is a huge challenge right now, because when you really want to show them exactly as you mentioned, all the things that they may lose in this uh, agile model in terms to basically don't have power, but you have the, the other power of coaching and lead teams and empower teams that is super different to the traditional way in terms to have micromanagement. I have the power, I have the, I have the organization. They don't really see them in a really bright side. And because they don't have really trust in the company, they don't really have a trust in the members in a 360 way. So how, how can you help or how can you basically try to suggest or provide advice for this young leader? Because we have a lot of things and potential with them, but the, the huge, uh, the huge part is that they don't really have see the power that they can really unleash when they have trust and psychological safety to really shift the mindset and say, I have been learned for this guy for so many years, but I have in the other side, this IL model. And I want to be part of them because I'm John and I see the results. And I can also teach them to the other leadership that we can do it. That is a specifically tragic moment, isn't it? That new motivated leaders in the company try to do things different, but they simply don't have a role model. And if they're humble enough, they're going to look up to exactly those experienced leaders you described. So what can I do? Honestly, absolutely nothing because this is something the company has to provide for we need role models so if you know if you start working with a company and even if it's, it doesn't always have to start in the top it can start right in the middle by middle management you got one person who said i i will i will make a change here this could be a role model for all the young or new leaders in the organization to look up to if they see this person succeed So when you have one or two areas that say, we're going to work different, we're going to lead different, you have to try to ensure 
to help them make them successful. Because this then can create a pool. There is my role model. There is a new path I can follow. If I'm, you know, if I'm looking for orientation, then I can do this. And there is one aspect that to me in my role as a consultant is highly frustrating. And that is if the people, you know, those secret power holders, which might not always be identified with their positions, but the people in power, if they don't tag along, if they don't support, that is, it's, it's lost It's wasted energy because then we have exactly this nice milk example. You got a young leader or you have an established leader who does things different and someone in power makes sure they have a negative consequence. Okay, fingers are burnt. I don't I actually don't have to try it in the next five years or so. That, that experience will stick to the organization. So it's really creating or not creating. It's asking the organization to allow for role models to allow them to be successful. Of course, the ideal situation is that the top of the organization are changing their ways and really you know, promote, uh, promote transparency, promote equal footing throughout the organization. If you have that from the top, then you know, even if the, the middle management is not, not really aligned with this, people look up to the top and then we're going to have On the bottom of the organization, we have those team leaders who say, hold on, I believe at the very top, we, things are expected differently and might be able then to, you know, just to start their own little revolution, if you want, from, from the edges. Guys, give me 30 seconds. We go for the break and we are back. I know Simon had a great question. Wait and we are back in 30 seconds. Enterprise Agility World Conference 2021. Join us on November 6th for the largest conference on enterprise agility, organizational change, and science. Visit enterpriseagility.university now to get a 20% discount and a copy of Leading Exponential Change. Enterprise Agility World Conference, where science meets organizational change. Are you looking for the latest advances in change management and enterprise agility? Learn how to reduce resistance to change, realign an organization in record time, and lead your company when it faces market disruptions. Visit enterpriseagility.university and learn more about our award-winning certified change consultant course. Enterprise Agility University, where science meets organizational change. Okay, guys, we are back, and Simon, go for it. I just love what you're saying about the role models and setting it up. I think it ties back to one of your earliest points, which is that we really need to set the conditions up for success. I had uh, some more successful and less successful experiences, and I, my, the metaphor I came up with is we need to create the preconditions so that the organization either treats this cultural difference as either a vac as the vaccine not the virus because where i've seen it really blow back and blow back hard is when the hidden people the the cabal of power breakers that are often not identified in the formal hierarchical structure but they're people who the, um, they're enmeshed in the organization they see agile as this big threat as the virus and all the organizational antibodies come out and just like every bit of bureaucracy, uh, every tool, every experiment is punished <laughs> severely. Yeah. Um, I just love the way you highlight that we need those role models to, to be there and we need them to be supported to reinforce that we were trying to do things differently. Yeah, absolutely. Because we are fighting a very healthy immune system, if you put it this way a very stable one. Those organizations for 50 years, 70 years, they they are successful because they are so incredibly consistent and stable and good and securing what they have. So like you said, if this is presented as a threat or virus, 
this is a very tough fight. Yeah. Is there anything that's worked particularly well for you in the the setup to to create the initial start conditions? Tell us at least two secrets so people who are not very experienced in um, organizational change, maybe they can do some tune up a little bit, change some something in the company, and they can be successful. At least they can start seeing the end of the corridor, the light at the end of the corridor. Yeah, small. I mean, it, things don't have to start big. Things can start very small. And, um, you know, within a the team, they, they can establish changes. And other teams are going to listen up. If those teams are now more successful, they might want to join. They might want to learn from them. So it can start small. My favorite approach is, and I like this in the whole Agile methodology, the focus on impediments. So we stand on a ground where we say we can be successful, full stop. We have everything that takes. However, there are impediments in our way. So I like to focus on this. And you will find that very quickly if the, you, the company is committed or not. So let's try to identify these impediments and you don't need a consultant to identify impediments. People can usually point them out, especially if you start you know, having one or two agile teams in place or one or two agile projects in place. Very fast, those people will start hitting the corners. They will start experiencing how far their area of control goes and where the limits are. Identifying impediments that might be relevant for a team. Maybe we can solve it on team level or they might be systemic and relevant across teams from the organizations. A process that slows things down. Uh, approval lines um, that go up on five levels of hierarchy and back down. Or pretty stupid things like I cannot work in a different building for some regulations, but I would like to work closer with that team. That's just small examples, but all those could be impediments. And once you have those identified, start removing them consequently. You have to have the board on board usually because some of that requires um, yeah, policies and regulations to change. Um, that is my favorite approach. And when people see, right, I know this is an impediment and they actually resolved it, That's nice. That gives me some motivation that shows me the way is being cleared for me to show my performance. This is my favorite approach. Focus on those impediments. Get them out of the way and then give the people space to fill, you know, whatever room you provide by removing those. People will fill it. They know, you know, they usually know what to do. If you think about your own job, you could probably be very successful without your boss telling you what to do. And maybe even more successful if your boss would listen to your ideas and, and your approaches. Yeah, so that's my favorite. I, I reckon you've just, a, a little light bulb went off in my head when you said, you know, if you take all the impediments away, you'll be more successful. I wonder if that's the reason that most successful agile coaches and consultants work for themselves. I, I wonder if there's, there's a pattern where there's a growth in people who are agile coaches, trainers, a lot of them work for smaller organizations or working for themselves as self-employed because then that bureaucracy is gone, right? And you've got more freedom. That is, if you, if you look into megatrends, how our working life and working conditions will develop, all predictions I've come across so far say that self-employment is going to increase significantly. Because it is the ultimate consequence of freedom. Um, that is absolutely true. Of course, you lose other things, but there are companies who try to, to um, you know, have like micro enterprises within the company, which basically is close to self-employment for the people. That seems to be a model that is working pretty well for some companies to give a maximum of freedom at the same time, still provide some job security mm -hmm. and some benefits. But yeah, absolutely. Like you said, I mean, The ultimate consequence, if you want the freedom, is you get it. <laughs> But then you don't, you, you lose a whole bunch of uh, benefits on the other hand as well. Yeah. But it, it does, I believe, if you act as a coach and you can act on an independent ground where you're not necessarily dependent on the people in the organization 
or involved in the in their politics or have a shared history i believe in your role as a coach it might be beneficial to have that have that distance to have this maybe more objectivity and uh, independence to to help the teams versus you're embedded in the system you're trying to to find and change but i do not want to say that the best RJ coaches are externals we don't because I don't believe in it. I believe that internal RJ coaches can be just as good as long as they really supervise each other to help, you know, help um thinking independently, maybe have a network outside the organization to get impulses from outside, share experience with with other RJ coaches from other companies. If you try to keep your horizon open, and reflect on your own dependencies on the company and within the structure it's a challenge but i believe it can be very rewarding because that is something i see in companies those who rely only on external agile coaches they have a very hard time to really start on a broad band having the organization move to agile because again what they build is a dependency to um external so it's that is not empowering for the people on board yeah regardless of whether you're an external or internal to an organization it's really important that you maintain that that openness so that you you can tap into the organizational history to help nudge it to a new history right um as well as if you're coming in from the outside you have to be respectful to that history yes and then and then working uh, it's like the the big C in the TEC model that you've written about is collaboration. Exactly. I wanted to change a little bit the direction of this conversation. So we have so many things to talk today. It's very interesting. And one of the things that Stephanie said, which is very important uh, for leaders or for anyone in an organization trying to create their I don't know if call it the right culture, but at least a healthy culture, is to be able to sense themselves, to sense others, and also to sense the market, what is happening in the market, right? I, if I don't sense myself, I don't know what's happening inside. If I don't sense others, I don't have empathy. I c cannot try to maybe reframe. I try to feel that maybe they are right. Maybe I'm wrong. A little bit of humility, intellectual humility is always good. But the question is, markets are accelerating. How we make sure that we can constantly sense the market if things are accelerating putting more pressure on people now with the pandemic we have seen many companies where people are working extra long hours we know about the zoom effect we know that it's not the same you're at home maybe you are happy at home but it's more difficult to connect how we make sure that as markets are accelerating we can still have healthy culture and i know it's not an easy question to answer Yeah, I see two questions in there. The one is increasing pressure to keep up with the market. And this provides a direct challenge in how do we how do we keep up a healthy culture? Like you said, it could end up in um, people burning out, working too many hours, trying to stay on top of the development, which is alone. That's not possible um, at all. So if you just look at that part of the question, When you look at startups who are, they are lean, they are nimble, they do not have a lot of processes in place, but beside a few areas where they are pretty heavily or have heavy processes, and that is to ensure that whatever happens on the market is immediately observed, is translated into a trend and into what might happen tomorrow and embedded in their decision-making processes. And these kind of processes and regulations here, you know, for example, um, uh, Amazon that says, if you don't have a metrics to control the success of your initiative, don't start the initiative. So there are, you know, that's, there are regulations in place and processes. And I believe this can take weight off of the single employee and team. If we have resources dedicated to keep up with developments and feed it back to the organization. And I know in my team that we will be, we have access to that information. 
and we are able to react fast, that takes that takes some um, stress off of me. So that is also a nice example of how, you know, given all the freedom, flexibility, some processes can help to stabilize the working conditions and help people to um, to stay on top of things without trying to, you know, like by themselves, trying to, to be on top of every development. And I think another part, what we see so far in self-organization, and there are some studies out there looking at the um, psychology of what happens in teams who start to self-organize, which is probably the most significant change they experience going to Agile. And it does show that in the short term, that does increase the stress level for people because they are confronted with um, planning, um, with working with each other. You know, I don't ask my boss, now I have to discuss with five colleagues what to do. So it does increase the stress. However, what it gives is it gives a higher sense of self-control over my work. And this is something which we know from organizational psychology, extremely healthy, extremely important for uh, stress and for my psychological health to be or have the feeling that I'm in control of my work. And if, yeah, I think this is to me one benefit. Agility in organizations with all the empowerment and self-organization has give people back the control of their work. And that helps us to also deal with much more stressful and um, faster changing market conditions. I'm in control of what I'm doing. And, and now that Eric mentioned, uh, Stephanie, these, uh, this hybrid work, I, I was about to ask you since the beginning, how hard is right now to really align culture in, in this, uh, in this built our works? Because something that we don't have right now is exactly to feel the culture way. Because we usually have in the way that we have to align to metrics. We have to align with goals as an employee. But we lose in the other way the sense of community, the sense of social agility that we have in the companies. And also sometimes either the lack of leadership from the leaders that they're supposed to be their role models for the rest of the company. It, I mean, it's, it's a hard time for a lot. And we know that some of companies, they are not going to really back in the way that they used to be. They're going to remain in a hybrid world. I'm going to ask you how uh, this environment in the hybrid world is really going to affect in terms to really rethink in an organization the culture that they have, if they really need to think about a new purpose, if they really to need to build a new culture and allow the employees to be part of, the, of this construction of this new culture. Because I think it's going to really become a something new eventually. We are not going to be in the way that we used to be two years ago. Hopefully. Uh, have you seen this? There's a post going around saying um, we need to get back in the office to really strengthen our culture. And then you see a picture with those cubicles, like all gray. And that's our culture. Great. Let's go back. So I think you're right. And this is a, this is a good test for organizations. We have this radical change we had to live through being remote for a lot of us and now maybe going in the direction of, of hybrid is that something we're gonna see as an opportunity to make or to to change to develop into something better or not because and i'm talking about germany here um they do not like remote work too much The leaders don't like, they feel like they're losing control. And you see the first, the enthusiasts, they all predicted. One good thing about COVID is, you know, at least in Germany, people are going to understand. They have to trust their people and they can work from everywhere. It's not happening. In some organizations, it might. In others, it will not. Because what they try is to, again, stabilize. They are afraid of this new, they're also afraid of hybrid. So they try to strengthen the structures they have in place and then replicate them in the remote working area. So whatever we've done before in person, we're now going to do in a video conference and so on. They try to replicate it. Smart companies, they say, stop it. And like you said, Monica, let's 
you know, with new page, clean sheet, how we want to work together with these new opportunities. And I think it starts by understanding this is a new amount of freedom we have by enabling people to choose where they want to work from. So how could that look like? And now the discussion here is often how do you regulate it? What kind of new policies do we need to have in place? Hybrid, is it two days in the office or three days or two and a half? And all this discussion show backwards. Stephanie, which uh, I think Germany is extremely regulated compared to other countries yes. where maybe sometimes things that you can do in other countries then maybe in Germany you cannot do it or then you have to ask the union if you yeah. can do it. Absolutely. And, and I think that that is different. Well, maybe in the UK it might be similar or not. I don't know. But how, how you deal with that? I think regulations, though, are only one part of the story. The other one is habit and is social pressure. You know, people are going to find, they, they tend to find a strict, a rigid norm they're trying to uh, then measure everyone else by. So maybe a team um, is extremely open and says, let's do the things remote. And then a few people are very reluctant to be flexible here as well and say, okay, Maybe, you know, some other parts of our work require a face-to-face -face here and there. Or you have the others who insist on people being in the office because otherwise they're just not, or for them it's more difficult otherwise to collaborate and connect. So what do people do? Are they going to go back and try to do what they can do best and what they know they do? Or, Monica, are they going to take the chance and find an experiment, and I think we haven't done this yet. I mean, let's say the pandemic is over and we can just, we can do whatever we want. Go in the office, work remotely. We can start really experimenting and letting the teams find out what works best for them. You know, and, instead of regulating it company-wide with some 2.5, six hours, something like that, just say, you know what? You in the team, you try it. Try it. You try it this way, you try it another way. Let's let's learn from it and let's then try to scale it, to scale what you guys learned, what works best for that for that company. I'm I'm curious, I'm observing which direction the companies are taking. There's a nationwide building society in the UK uh, has taken a very forward looking step uh, and they have implemented a work from anywhere policy and they will support each employee. Uh, to be able to find the appropriate conditions for them to work, whether it's remotely or in an office. And they'll, they'll provide the right support for each person provided you can deliver on your role. They've, they've taken that off the table and they're not mandating office work. But, it, you know, there's flexible spaces so that when you need to co collaborate with your colleagues and you need to see each other face to face, they'll find space so that you can come and do that. But I'm, I see that happening more and more. Mm -hmm. uh, That's great. And if, if we can get, um, provided we are compliant, and this is where having compliance people in each team just takes that impediment away. I think this is a, you know, what, what you say here, people are trusted to take the right decision. And I think this is key. I like the fact that the individual here is really empowered to take a decision. If this is going to work out, I'm very curious about, because you have a team, and at least in a lot of settings, you have this, team that is codependent and I'm sure there are some social rules emerging with you know those individual preferences might not always match but I think I mean you know there are some people who say give the power to the team they have to decide they have to be democratic or whatever and others say no no let's give the power to the individual and see what what works I'm not in favor of either or I'm more curious and I could also see that different industries different maybe even different countries favor a different approach here. I love the idea because when you mentioned, uh, let's ask the leader to the rest of the of, of the teams, you have the freedom to start to co-create. What are we going to do right now? What are, the go what are going the, to be right now, the new process, the new way of working? It's, it's a challenge, the members also, to start to change the mindset and start also to create a new psychological safety in a new environment in order to create a new culture, a new new way to work in a, a small environment or in a small 
space, as you say, and also allow to the employees to understand that they can be also be part of the change. It's a huge message. It's a power message for the leaders in terms to also create and, and show them that we can also move into an new ways to work in agile models and to provide freedom and collaboration and then add the transparency to say, don't be afraid to mention if this is not working or if it is working. Because I think it's also important if you provide the freedom, you can also say it's valid to say it is working, it is right or it is wrong. Because sometimes there is a lack of trust in the employees in the company. And And, and I see it right now in most of the company. When you say feedback, outside from the agile model from IT, they always think feedback is bad. Feedback is enhanced. And I always mention feedback is not about that. The feedback and, and, and be transparency, uh, keep transparency from all of us is to understand what, what we are doing right and what can we do better? And what are the learnings that we are having right now in the organization? So uh, in that way, my last question to you, Stephanie, how do you see is that the leaders can see that kind of changes in terms to really use headwinds for them to start to, to do the step zero or step one in to really become in an in a agile model? If you think this is a good point, a break point that we can leverage to really show results and they can see the powerful to start to move in these uh, new models? Yeah, I think one danger you pointed out is if we're going to try a new way of working and we fail, we make a mistake, then there are going to be plenty of people pointing their fingers saying, I knew it, I knew it. Let's go. Let's just go back to the way it was. It's the safest way. And I think, I don't think we need a mindset change, but we need to focus on things different. We need to become little detectives. We need to become problem solvers. So if we make, an, make a mistake or we fail with a new approach, that is great. This is going to bring us one step ahead. So we have to look at this from a learning perspective, say, you know what, we just gained a new point of information. We didn't have that one before. Let's incorporate it in our thinking. We have a new, a new information here. We know what does not work. So great. Let's go from there and try it different. And, you know, modify it. Learn from it. And I think if we really manage to embrace agility, this is going to become our new normal. But there is no new standard we achieve, but we achieve to learn. We achieve to go from, from A to B to C. <laughs> It's step by step. I mean, this is uh, agility really in the heart, you know, trying to iterate our way through those new environments. Stephanie, you're going to be on the 6th of November in our conference. Just tell people in one minute what they can expect from your talk. Uh, we are very curious about it. I would love to have the opportunity to um, put the TC model out for discussion and Simon, you mentioned those little monkeys in this experiment. So I'm thinking about a psychological deep dive into culture, trying to make us all understand and realize what culture really is and how we can influence it. There is this idea of culture being this shadow or being elusive, something foggy and maybe even like, you know, purpose, like nice clouds somewhere. But culture is hands on and all of you described you know from a learning experience conditioning and really circumstances in place that all is a very real part of culture and as long as we learn and make experiences as long culture is going to develop it's not a static thing so i hope in this this event to motivate people to look at culture as a lever of a lever of change something they can utilize maybe i don't want to say a tool but a lever to, to realize change. And then I will also like to, um, which we didn't have the time here, drop in a few examples. How is, how is transparency lived in progressive companies? Just, you know, try out some nuggets that really show um, different ways other companies have already implemented. So that is also going to be my, my goal here. And people, if they're there, they can contribute. And we're going to look for hands-on hacks. What can I do as an individual? to make a change tomorrow in my own environment. 
So this would be my vision for this talk. And now I just have to sit down and write it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you, Simon Reindel from the UK for joining and helping today and Monica Costa from Mexico. Stephanie, thank you very much for joining today. We are looking forward, all of us, to read your book, The Agile Culture Coach. We are looking forward to seeing you on the 6th of November. And just a quick reflection. I just was making some notes during this conversation. Guys, just try to think big. When you think big, your language changes, your posture changes, your thought changes. Act small. Don't try to change the world in one day. And I try to understand people's motivation and have in mind that maybe others can be right and you can be wrong. So enjoy being wrong. Thank you very much, guys. And I will see you next week. Thank you for joining, guys. Beyond Organizational Change is proudly presented by the Enterprise Agility University. The place where science meets organizational change. Visit us at enterpriseagility.university.